On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and I'm honored to welcome Dr. Eugenia Giannis. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us, and I'm really excited to learn um, everything you have to teach us about cardiology and preventive cardiology in particular, but first, let's get to know you a little bit. If you could just tell us why you wanted to become a doctor and specifically why cardiology. Sure. You know, the, the field of medicine uh, is something that I think a lot of people go into for, for very different reasons. For me, it was just wanting to help people to make a difference in their lives, to change how uh, they conduct their lives. And cardiology was appealing just because of the excitement and truthfully the interventions and bringing people you know, in and doing procedures that can change their outcomes. Interestingly enough though, I shifted gears entirely when I got into cardiology onto this preventive aspect, um, which for me <clears throat> has been one of the greatest things because you can combine innovative advanced therapies with very basics of lifestyle and prevention and keep people from needing those advanced procedures. Mm, that's fantastic. And so when you mentioned preventive cardiology, what does that entail exactly? It's a relatively emerging field, you know, certainly cardiology in general uh, always incorporates some degree of prevention, of course, but the field itself nowadays, because of the uh, advancements in genetics, in risk assessment, in advanced therapies for cholesterol, for diabetes, for blood pressure, really requires an entirely different field where people are expert at individualizing treatment, at knowing how to assess an individual's risk, figure out the best lifestyle program, as well as the best medical therapy, if in fact that's what's indicated. So it's really an exciting field because you can do every aspect of medicine and really make a tremendous difference. That's fantastic. So when you speak of preventive cardiology and you're talking about all these patients, I mean, it sounds like every single one of my family practice type patients. So let's say someone doesn't have access to a preventive cardiologist with your expertise and individualized care or treatment options. What should a primary care doctor be looking for, be asking these questions so that we know like, well, maybe we should really work hard to find a preventive cardiologist or where do we begin that? Like what, so what would someone like myself be looking for in a patient? Excellent. The, the main thing I think is understanding two aspects. One is, and it's, you know, the whole environment and genetics and which one is actually at play. You need to understand both really, really well. So I think that both patients themselves, but also clinicians, family practice clinicians, OBGYNs, internal medicine, everyone really can be doing a, a great job with family history, first of all. You know, we have a genetics team that sits down with a patient and takes a family history, and every single one of them comes to me and says, we have never had our family history checked like this before. You know, they ask about every first degree relative and exactly what disease, et cetera. Um, so family history is so important. And I think we often don't give enough time to really understanding, do you have two relatives that had a heart attack at a young age? Someone died early, um, suddenly, was that a heart attack? Was that a clot? Was that a rhythm issue? Um, it's a, you know, you really wanna understand what people are at risk for that's number one. And two is assessing their lifestyle, which I think that, you know, we're working to incorporate more questionnaires into the intake forms for patients to really ask these questions. It's, it's a detailed, comprehensive look at what their lifestyle is. But as we've discussed before, you know, patients um, in lifestyle, even if they're doing a plant-based diet, can be very different from one case to another. So you really have to ask all of the questions to understand where that risk is. Absolutely. So is there a resource that you like recommend for especially your young cardiologists who are learning preventive cardiology or maybe a family practice doc or internal medicine, OB, these primary care folks to start looking and learning like how they should start assessing these patients? Sure. So there are pretty much all of the major organizations have a focus on this nowadays. Um, and the good thing is for trainees, almost all of them 
have free programs, free membership for uh, trainees as well. Um, so it's very simple to get involved. So there's the National Lipid Association, which has a very dedicated program. You can get certified in lipidology. You can just do um, questions online just to learn and read. There's the American Society for Preventive Cardiology, which has great programs also online, um, as well as an exam to get a certification. Um, there is the American College of Cardiology and a prevention section, um, which is dedicated as well as a, a we have a committee on nutrition, um, which is um, very, very uh, helpful in terms of learning. Um, and then the American Heart Association, another major one, um, all of which have you know, education online, they have councils, committees, um, things for people to get involved in and to learn. And I would think that um, even likely internal medicine, other places have um, similar things um, as well. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm, I'm actually working on the, the National Lipid Association's um, uh, accreditation. It's a very good ah, program. Yeah. I've learned a ton already so um because i i get all these patients here and then maybe some of them won't have access to some like you so i feel like i need to at least have the very basics and a really good understanding of where i need to take it a next step and maybe find someone for them um so that's really important but i love the american heart Association. they have great education for my patients as well they're very yeah. well done um yeah. easy to understand heart yeah. failure hypertension all that yeah. Very good website. Um, Every single one of the major organizations, as a matter of fact, has great handouts that are already nice. made. So you don't have to go and do them, you know, from start. And, and ACC has um, CardioSmart, which is an entire website dedicated to patient education as well. Ah, CardioSmart. So, yeah. And I, of course, the guidelines, the ACC guidelines, and there's so much information. Um, and it's hard, you know, it's, we all are short on time with patients. And it's just really just understanding, find your, your place and get, highly educated so you can help the patients make better decisions. Because like we say, heart disease is our number one killer. It's so very important <laughs> that we are on top of it. So if we can just kind of move towards a little bit more towards um, the patients that I see and some of the people who are listening. So these are going to be people who are plant curious <laughs> or mm -hmm. looking to do a plant-based diet or on a plant-based diet, yet they may have some stubborn numbers. Um, so in particular, let's say if you have, yeah, I know your focus is on women, um, just in a general sense, what should women be looking for? How can we help women understand how to prevent um, any type of heart attack or risk factors, cardiovascular factors in women? Is there anything special we need to be doing or paying attention to? Sure. In women, the issue I think is that we often just get to the game a little bit late in terms of trying to prevent things. Uh, we sort of view the childbearing years as a time where we're just going to do nothing <laughs> and observe. Um, and historically, even in pregnancy, um, you know, I think that you know there used to be a very laissez-faire. You can have whatever you want to eat during pregnancy, gain weight, don't worry about it, it'll be mm. fine. Um, and now we're realizing, you know, you need to understand what a woman's risk is early in her life. Um, in the times that she's not trying to be pregnant and, and not actively, um, you know, trying to get pregnant and is on contraception, uh, they then, you know, having a woman on optimal treatment if she is at high risk is very important for as many of the years uh, that you can. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding that you will stop as needed and allow and respect a, a woman's wishes to have a family. Um, and I think that uh, even pregnancy, we've now become uh, aware that the outcomes of pregnancy, uh, the adverse uh, pregnancy outcomes, including preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, low uh, birth weight or preterm labor, all portend a higher cardiovascular risk in the long term. So we really need to um, ask the right questions. I have a um, you know little questionnaire that we ask all our women, and you know when I give talks, I often say, well, how would you know that a woman um, had you know preterm labor? Or had, Apparently you have to ask these questions, you know, like these are not things that any woman, you know, sort of volunteers because she does, why would she think it's relevant? Um, right. So, you know, things that we need to ask to really um, be able to further appreciate risk in a woman, I think that's different from a man. That makes great sense. And, you know, I, I interviewed someone else, I can't remember which interview it was, I've had a lot <laughs> recently, um, <laughs> but it makes perfect sense. I mean, what my grandmother did during the pregnancy with my mother affected me because my mother's ovaries were producing or had the eggs that were me later. And so I, what I did with my daughters is <laughs> an affect my grandchildren. So it really blows my mind and makes me think about some things. Um, but yeah, yeah it, 
it's fascinating. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, and then when you, what foods do you recommend that women or patients in general should be adding or removing from their diet? When you look at a really heart focused diet, what would be the best diet that you would recommend? Sure. I mostly focus, I think, on a similar diet for men and women, um, unless a woman is pregnant, in which case her uh, energy requirements might be a little different. But, um, you know, I do feel that a plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet, in a healthy fashion is the right. perhaps most optimal uh, diet. Now, um, you know, the Mediterranean diet also has very good evidence in terms of randomized control trials. Uh, to show benefit. And if anything, perhaps that kind of data is perceived as even stronger uh, data. Um, but having said that, I do think that how you do the Mediterranean diet is also important. So if, if most of your uh, uh, Mediterranean diet is plant-based, um, mm -hmm. which is in fact the way uh, the Mediterranean cultures lived many years ago, and including my parents who um, you know were in Greece in the time of a recession when, you know, they mostly ate beans and vegetables and, um, you know, uh, starches, et cetera, and very infrequently had a chicken <laughs> or right. you know, meat like um, once a month and eggs maybe once a week because that's really what they had. So the bulk of their diet was plant-based. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we think about uh, Mediterranean cultures, I think we have to understand that the overlap is, you know, substantial. Um, and so that is, I think, the best thing. And I try to guide patients towards a um, plant predominant or a spectrum and, you know, just encouraging them, you know, to go as much as they can um, and not to get discouraged if, you know, they're not fully there. Gotcha. Absolutely. I, exactly. We're meet them where they're at, but and continue to encourage to keep yeah. moving the, the a little bit closer to ideal. Yes. So when you have someone who's eating, let's say, a plant-based diet, and they have no previous um, heart disease that's known or risk factors, they're not diabetic or hypertensive, they're a healthy weight, yet their numbers are stubbornly high. Let's, you know, I'll get patients, they're typically the ones that get, are concerned in the, you know, upper maybe 180s to the lower 200s, their LDL is borderline. Mm -hmm. um, what do you suggest for those individuals? Sure. You know, one important thing is knowing their underlying risk. So for mm. somebody who has a very strong family history of heart disease, for example, um, and their risk, even with a LDL that's just borderline, may be you know, substantially higher, uh, mm. then I may be more aggressive and even recommend a, a medication, you know, a statin. Mm. Um, so I think using the guidelines, doing a risk assessment before you actually, you know, work with the patient, knowing the risk, and even sometimes sending additional testing to know if they're genetically at risk. Um, but then, you know, whether they are going to need a medication or not, I'm going to recommend, you know, eating a predominantly plant-based diet regardless. And then I kind of counsel them, you know, to use more fiber to like really pay attention to how much they got in order to lower the LDL. I, I try to explain that really we're trying to get to 20 to 30 grams at least a day. Um, and I think sometimes people think that their diet is fairly healthy, as you know, myself included, when I used to eat what I thought was like low fat, I thought I was eating healthy, but a lot of it was just processed carbs and not enough um, you know, fiber, not enough uh, nutritious vegetables and fruits, um, things that are important, you know, for health. So I try to have them focus on the fiber and then also look into what could they be eating that's holding them back. Sometimes also, you know, uh, patients are having, you know, significant amounts of oils and even coconut oil, which can raise saturated fat and, you know, really asking exactly what it is that they are eating that they can potentially modify. Mm. Okay, excellent. And so let's say that they're eating that low to no oil, but their numbers, and they, uh, would you recommend, this is when you said ad additional testing, what additional testing would you recommend? Is it the CAC score? What is there a specific genetic test that we should be looking at or patients asking for? Uh, for most patients who are, uh, you know, younger and have a family history of early heart disease, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, and especially if the patient themselves has high cholesterol, that's unexplained. You know, when the patient tells you, you know, I eat a bacon, egg and cheese for breakfast, <laughs> double cheeseburger for lunch. And, you know, then you, you kind of know why that cholesterol is high. Right. Um, and the patient who really doesn't have as many risk factors yet, their cholesterol is 
you know, elevated and they have this family history of early heart disease. Mm. The top two things I think of are, um, one is something called lipoprotein A elevation. It's a cholesterol marker that's a little different than LDL cholesterol. Um, Mm. It is similar in structure, uh, but also has a moiety that uh, leads to um, inhibition of uh, plasminogen, which um, essentially causes thrombosis. So you're more at risk for clotting and you're more at risk for atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's something that is is a simple thing that we can do for most patients, you know, especially if they, we think that they are uh, suspected to have this genetic component. And when we know that they have an elevated LPA, one, we screen their family members, and two, we, can, we know to treat them more aggressively in terms of getting their LDL low. So it really does change their management, and I think we underutilize that as a uh, component um, of risk assessment. And then I also think of familial hypercholesterolemia in patients who have an elevated LDL. Granted, it's usually with an LDL of greater than even 190 is when we really suspect, but there can be patients, depending on what their phenotype is, that have an LDL of even 150 or 160 and have um, familial hypercholesterolemia. In that case, um, you can diagnose them based on risk algorithms, uh, scoring tools that either incorporate uh, physical exam findings, family history, and their cholesterol numbers, or get genetic testing. Um, So those are two very important uh, components. And lastly, the CAC score, as you asked about, you know, that I use in patients who are over 40 or 45, because in the younger patient, they're likely not going to have uh, calcified plaque, even if they have plaque. So then it won't be useful. So the intermediate patient um, in that age range, then I will, it's an excellent uh, risk stratification tool. Nice. Okay. And those are readily accessible. They're not very expensive. Um, People would ask like, well, what about the radiation exposure? But it's very minimal, right? It's, uh, it is, it is. It's focused on the heart, uh, you know, so it's not the entire chest and it's much less than a CAT scan for sure. Yes. Excellent. And um, I was speaking, as you know, uh, Dr. Kim Williams recently, and he had mentioned there was recent HDL research about going being too high and increasing risk for heart attack or it was could you go into that further i haven't had a chance to read any of this so i'm i'm really intrigued <laughs> we've been seeing this clinically unfortunately for a while you know when i was uh, early in my being an attending i had seen many women come in with heart attacks even with their hdl of 100 um wow. not uncommonly Um, And, you know, the issue is the functionality of the HDL is what is most important, not just the number. Um, Mm -hmm. And now that's what's, you know, appreciated as being the more important component. And the way I view it, too, is we now understand that the LDL is the most important number. There even was emphasis on downplaying the LDL if the ratio of HDL to LDL was okay. And people would say that all the time, oh, my LDL is high, but it's okay because my ratio is very good, Mm -hmm. which is in fact not true. Um, Mm -hmm. And I view it as if in fact your HDL, which clears cholesterol, is working so great, it should be lowering your LDL and your LDL Mm -hmm. will be at goal. (laughs) Right, right. And if it's not, then perhaps that HDL is not as functional as you think. Mm -hmm. So really our main focus in preventive cardiology is getting the LDL as low as possible. As a matter of fact, probably even uh, optimal LDL is as low as even 50, perhaps even lower. And we're not even Mm -hmm. concerned about numbers being that, you know, low at all. Too low, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, but now if we have someone who's eating a plant-based diet, let's say, for example, myself, my, my biological father had his first heart attack at 38, survived. Um, my mother's dad died at 46 of a heart attack that I am aware of. Um, but I have zero risk factors as far as, as um, other risk factors, hypertension, diet, nothing like that at all. Cholesterol is low. Like my LDL has always been under 70, probably even under 50. So for those individuals, and I'm 50, who should we just be like cruising this looking at their LDL or with those genetic risk factors, would you consider still a CAC score at this age? Great question. Um, and I'm so happy to hear that your numbers are all great. You know, it's yeah. really huge. And I always tell people that, you know, even when you're born with a significant genetic risk, you do have a tremendous ability to ameliorate that risk with lifestyle. So mm-hmm. you know, you're really doing that. So I think you should have faith to some extent in the lifestyle uh, that you've been leading, reducing your risk. So that is really, really helpful. Um, I would also suggest getting a lipoprotein A. 
Um, mm -hmm. I sometimes, uh, you know, it, it's an it's a separate marker from the LDL. It, uh, mm -hmm. The cholesterol content in the uh, uh, L lipoprotein A can sometimes, when you measure um, LDL, uh, it can be you can get a higher number because it's also measuring uh, from the L uh, LPA. So sometimes, uh, you know, when you see somebody has a high LDL that's really not responding very well mm -hmm. to diet to different things. It might be that they have an elevated lipoprotein A, or they could have familial hypercholesterolemia, where even with a good diet, they're just not enough receptors to clear the LDL. Right. Um, so in your case, it's good that the LDL is very low. It's still possible that you might have an elevated lipoprotein A, and it'd just be good to know that mm. you have this genetic predisposition and you want to always be careful. Sure. And yeah, a calcium score is, you know, uh, very little downside, um, I think, to, to knowing could you have early plaque without knowing it. I doubt it. If you really have had your LDL levels in optimal range for this long, then. Yeah, even um, before going plant-based about nine years ago, they were all low, always low. So because I ate fairly well, but growing up, like, you know, you mentioned your folks, we didn't have money. So honestly, we ate meat on occasion, but we ate a lot of beans and potatoes and vegetables were grown in our garden because that was cheap. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You know, so no money in the bank is actually good for your health. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so when you look at these individuals and let's say you do have someone who um, did have these restrictors, they were diabetic, hypertensive, um, but now they've switched to a plant-based diet and they've been doing this for a while, their cholesterol is naturally lower. Um, and, and whether they were on a statin or not, maybe they had, hadn't done it, or maybe they chose to stop with themselves, which I get a lot of these patients who's like, I don't want to be on a statin. We have this discussion, <laughs> you know? So, um, but now their cholesterol is in, in more of an optimal range, maybe under 70 is, would be more realistic in the sense of what I'm seeing. Um, when is it okay to stop someone that had previous risk factors or should they always be on a statin or do we do the CAC score then? I'm like, what, where should those decisions in that conversation be occurring with their doctors? That's a tough, tough decision um, indeed. And sometimes it is a matter of also um, having an open conversation with the patient and understanding their preference. And sometimes patients who have had a heart attack or even, you know, have substantial disease um, are not open to staying on a statin, unfortunately, you know, despite my recommendations. And I have to respect, you know, what their preference is. I try to make sure they have all the evidence and the facts when they're mm. making this decision. Right. Um, my, my thought is if you've had disease, you know, if this is what we call secondary prevention, somebody who already has a stent, who has, you know, a 50% narrowing or other plaque that's been noted, I do feel that a statin is a very low risk, important uh, therapy that reduces heart attack, stroke, and worthwhile in the long term. Um, mm -hmm. I often give the example of my dad, who uh, who is at the age of 75, um, reluctant to take a statin, despite the fact that, you know, he had borderline cholesterol, borderline blood pressure, and he was 75. I said, dad, you know, it's really important. And he had a <laughs> very, very, oh, and he got a calcium score to um, risk assessment, it was like 30. And he said, you see, it's very low. I'm okay. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, the reality is that, um, but then sadly, you know, he had a tiny stroke, which was so minimal that he's totally fine. But now he understands that he needed that statin, um, mm. that you know, he may have had, you know, a decent calcium score, he had whatever, but his age is still 75. His, mm. you know, LDL is what it is. And it's been that way, you know, even higher in the past. So a small thing that can improve your quality of life, keep you from having a devastating event, I think is a big, big deal. Now, for people who are on a diet and, and reverse their diabetes, their hypertension, no longer have those risk factors and don't have disease, I'd be okay potentially if they got their LDL low enough mm. in keeping them off of a, a statin. Gotcha. So this would be where, would a CAC score be helpful in making that decision? Yes. A, a, some kind of a assessment of subclinical atherosclerosis and it's probably the best predictive one that we have um, mm. you know you can look for car carotid plaque in the arteries but it's very uh, variable <laughs> variable it's you often it's a very specific uh, good um, risk predictor but it's rare that you'll find plaque and, and the calcium mm. score I think is a much a better predictor so yes it's very helpful awesome okay um, and then so let's say if someone um, has these high stubborn triglycerides, what can we do if they're optimizing, they're staying away from the oil, the added sugars, of course, all the dietary intervention. What would you suggest for someone like that? It seems like their triglycerides are the, the, you know, the highlight of the show. Is there anything there that you, you recommend? 
Yes, no, that's a, a good point that it is often tied into the sugars and their mm. risk of having the high triglycerides, you know, sometimes it's tied into diabetes. We, we see this all the time. Uh, you know, the typical cardiometabolic patient has a low HDL, high triglycerides, <laughs> uh, elevated sugars. It's, it all comes together usually. So I think very, very often, and patients don't always realize that their diet is not optimal from a, a glucose uh, level, you know, just because mm. they're not eating cookies and ice cream, but they are eating a lot of bread, pasta, you know, processed at least, um, you know, foods that is not high in fiber, you know, not sustainable and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's one of the first places to look. And that's usually the answer in many cases. Another uh, very common explanation is alcohol. Um, mm. Alcohol is very frequently the culprit for hypertriglyceridemia. Um, and exercise is amazingly effective at lowering triglycerides. Um, I always give an example of a woman who went in college and playing lacrosse for four years and uh, you know, being so active, her triglycerides stayed exceptionally well controlled. And as soon as she graduated, took a desk job and <laughs> had drinks with friends periodically, it was all downhill, you know, the, the numbers go up tremendously. Um, wow. So it's amazing how much the exercise can keep them at bay. Uh, and then there are genetic issues, you know, that, you know, mm. potentially you may have a fairly reasonable diet and yet be predisposed to have elevated triglycerides. And those patients, unfortunately, have to be on a very low fat diet as well. Mm. Um, it, it can be very limiting, actually. Um, so, you know, it's important to understand the etiology. Start with the very easy, more common culprits, I think. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it is just a more complicated genetic issue. So speaking of <clears throat> very specific dietary intervention, so I get a lot of questions regarding fruit and fructose and the triglycerides. Do you have any thoughts on, are there fruits that we should be avoiding? Are they all okay? What is your suggestions for that? Yeah, it makes me a little crazy when patients entirely avoid fruit, period. Um, yep. It's just fascinating. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think certainly uh, somebody who's diabetic likely shouldn't have five fruits a day. Uh, maybe that's, you know, too many. Um, and yes, picking the fruits that have more fiber and nutrients and you know, less sugar, you know, again, it's, it's hard for me to say exactly with respect to glycemic index of the fruit or mm. the exact fiber content and whatnot. But um, I think that the key concept is that they do generally come with, you know, fiber, vitamins, minerals, um, antioxidants that are so important for your health. Mm. And, you know, these plant-based diets have shown repeatedly that if you follow them in a correct manner, Mm -hmm. um, that you can actually reverse diabetes as well. So it's oh, yeah. a big misconception that, oh, I can have fruit. And I hear it all the time. I can't have fruit because I'm a diabetic. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, unfortunately, you know, many people even in their diets are eating, you know, significant amounts of pasta and, you know, some ice cream is a bit, but limit not eating any fruit because they're, you know, concerned. So <laughs> It's just unfortunate. And I think, you know, we're depriving uh, ourselves of, of benefits of fruit. Right. Absolutely. No, I, I have re helped reverse plenty of diabetics eating fruit. <laughs> now there may be points in time when they're first starting a plumbing set, we say focus on the berries. We'll worry about exactly. bananas and stuff later. <laughs> exactly. And, and at least two, I'm like, I always say, you know, if you have a cup of berries and an apple, Day. It's unlikely that that's going to do you in for sure. They do phenomenally well on that, right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love, and I love the continuous glucose monitors. I try to get every single patient on that and yes, I monitor that. so helpful. Oh and my you goodness. You understand better what it is that's raising those sugars. Yes. And doing telemedicine, we can share the screens and we're talking about it. I've worn them myself just yeah. out of curiosity. Um, yeah. it's, a, I, it's a wonderful tool. Oh, so if we can get, Good yes. Thing. Oh my goodness, it's fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Learned where to get them cheaper. So if you guys have any questions about where to do that as well, because yeah. a lot of and a lot of insurance isn't covering those unless they're um, insulin dependent diabetics. It's really right. hard to get them covered. Yeah, so, um, it's insane. Um, but anyway, I, I have there's so many more questions I have for you. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you were mentioning the LPA, what should we do? Is there anything? dietary that we can do to help lower that specifically? Is it lowered by diet? 
And if not, what doses of statins should we be looking at? Are these low um, statin dosages, medium, high? Where should we be focusing on that component since that's a very one that will probably dive deeper on these healthy plant eaters? <laughs> that's true. You know, with LPA, it is uh, something that in Europe right now, um, they universally check it in every person one time in their lifetime, just to know. And, and truthfully, it's so cost effective. It's a simple blood test that you check once and you know if somebody is at higher risk uh, for heart disease, stroke, uh, early aortic stenosis also is another, you know, uh, risk of uh, having an elevated lipoprotein A. So that, um, you know, you know at least your risk. Currently, uh, lifestyle really does not affect lipoprotein A much at all. Um, the things that do lower it are aspirin to some extent, niacin, estrogen, hmm. uh, interestingly, um, PCSK9 inhibitors to a reasonable amount, about 30%. Apheresis, if you did LDL apheresis, that can also lower it. And currently they do have in, uh, in trials, as a matter of fact, the outcomes trials have now begun a sort of antisense oligonucleotide to lipoprotein A. So now we're going to be waiting for yeah. the outcomes trials in that area. So I think for people who have elevated lipoprotein A, you know, knowing that now, you know, they'll know if they are a candidate in the future for, you know, drugs and development. Um, but no, I think that the key and how, how aggressively do you treat how, what potency statin, um, you know, a number of factors come in. I think you still want to figure out their baseline inherent risk, how high risk they are based on the guidelines. Um, if you think somebody's at, you know, high risk for an event, then using a a uh, high potency statin is, a, is definitely the way to go. And from my standpoint, honestly, I think, you know, knowing how much lowering they're gonna go get to, I do think that our guidelines in, in several years will get to a point where they try to get everyone to 50. I mean, it's not exactly where we are right now, um, okay. but I think that if in fact, the way you prevent atherosclerosis is throughout your lifetime, you keep that LDL, as low as possible. Um, it's hard to prove that in a primary prevention setting and show that you know you can prevent disease because you have to follow patients for so long in order to show that. Um, but I think that's the goal. So with patients, you know, I may you know even if they got to 90 um, with a, a low potency statin, maybe they can do a little more with diet and you know get it further down and things like that. Um, I encourage them to get there, um, but you know, again, we don't have definite evidence, you know, in more in all of them that they need to get very, very low. Wow. Okay. Excellent. So, and I know we're closing in on time. So, could if there's any bit of advice or something you'd want anyone listening, uh, either the physicians who are listening or patients who are, you know, questioning themselves and they were balancing between should I be on a statin, should I not, who do I speak to, any advice that you would like them to know or what should we know or where should we go, anything at all? Sure. My uh, biggest recommendation, I mean, the one thing that saddens me the most is to see young patients coming in with disease, really mm. like, you know, devastating strokes, heart attacks in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, truly. Um, and I think that's a, uh, a combination of both, uh, you know, poor lifestyle coupled with a very high genetic uh, predisposition. And we're just seeing the worst of the worst outcomes together. Um, but I think my biggest thing is for everyone out there, you know, even at a young age to find out and advocate for themselves what their risk is. So there are risk calculators that you can plug your numbers in to see, you know, where you're at. Um, knowing uh, your full family history, asking the details. And it might be that you actually have to call your <laughs> mom and say, why did Uncle Louis die again? <laughs> did they have an autopsy? You know, it's, it's, it actually right. requires investigative work, um, but wow. really understanding what you are at risk for, um, then getting the appropriate, you know, screening tests, tools, different things that can help to guide you. And then, you know, so that's to individualize your treatment, but mm. then I think there's also a need for universal uptake of lifestyle, you know? So whether right. you're at risk or not, everybody needs to really work on exercise, diet, psychosocial health, well-being, all that stuff. Um, so those are my two lessons, you know, know your risk 
and regardless, work on lifestyle. <laughs> oh, that's that's a great summary. And um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I'm sure there's <laughs> many more questions that people are asking, like, why didn't you ask this? So I'm like, maybe next time, maybe a second interview. It's um, an expanding was, field, so we can keep uh, uh, discussing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I thank you so much for your time. And we really appreciate you and your work that you're doing and helping people stay well and get well. Thank you. And thank you for all that you're doing. Thanks for watching. And I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go, though, please hit the subscribe button and the alert button so you will be notified whenever we upload any new videos. On Monday, we upload the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find it on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. On Tuesdays, we upload The Doctors In. This is where I answer your questions. Thinking of that, could you please comment below any questions you might have about health or wellness or any topics that you would like me to cover? Now, if you're looking for more resources on how to start a plant-based diet, sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, anything regarding wellness, we've got you covered. Check out HealthyHumanRevolution.com. And again, thanks for watching.